Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week is my pleasure to introduce Gavin Ashton from Stealth Bits. Gavin has been mentioned on our show previously during our ransomware episodes where we referred to his blog article. He famously wrote this article to document his time with NotPetya and Maersk and his time at that company going through the ransomware incident. And so I'm extremely excited to have this conversation to interview someone who has been through a real life ransomware incident. Gavin, welcome to the show. Give a little introduction about yourself to our audience. Cheers, Andy. Um, yeah, I'm Gavin Ashton. Um, so you just mentioned uh, my experiences at Maersk. Um, before then, I, I fell into the identity game from pretty much the start of my career. So, you know, this year 2000, got into AD as it was released into the environment I was at. And then um, at that point, I happened to be uh, working for a police force in the UK. So um, security and, and identity and, and directory security, they've been um, featuring heavily throughout my career. So since then, um, I've been dipping in and out of consulting and operational, so in house roles, um, identity management, Microsoft Identity Manager, lots of Azure AD, BPOS before that, you know, 365, etc. So um, I've had a good sort of mix of mix of roles, you know, through the past sort of 20 or so years. Um, since um, since Maersk, um, went travelling for a bit, um, came back to the UK, joined a, a UK uh, Microsoft partner. Uh, called Visual, um, and they were great. And then uh, that that post sort of blew up, went viral, or what have you. Um, and then uh, ended up at Stealth Bit. So they've they've basically reached out and said, Gav, you know, we'd love to love you to come and join us as a security strategist. Um, and uh, they basically cooked up a role that's sort of custom custom spec just for me. So it's great, you know, I'm having a, I'm having a great time there. Um, so these days I'm working with their um, product team. Um, working with our customers, you know, just getting involved in all sorts of stuff, webinars, etc. So, yeah, it's awesome. So, one of my questions right from the start is, for our security defenders who are out there, you know, a ransomware incident is fairly similar across the board for most companies. If you are in a position to be compromise for ransomware, that company may look very similar to another company that may be vulnerable mm -hmm. to it, as well as going through a ransomware incident, you know, the steps and feelings that you may have will be very similar across the board as well. So mm -hmm. since you've been through one, as you look back on the incident, when you're at a company, if you're a security defender, what are some clues right away that you may be vulnerable to a ransomware attack? If I see something, I'm like, I should really fix this. Otherwise, yeah. we're, we may be vulnerable. Yeah. So, I mean, before I even joined Maersk, you know, the, the early parts of my career, things like the principle of least privilege were always something that I strove for in the operational roles that I had, right? Um, so you know, how do we administer access to infrastructure, service, workstations, and so on? And that was always just a, I guess, a best practice thing. And the justification would always be, oh, well, we want to control, you know, insider risk or, you know, whatever threats. It's just a best practice. We should do this stuff. And then in different environments, they did it to sort of different levels. And, you know, you didn't really think much else of it. You did what you could. But now having been through it, you think, oh, okay, yeah, all that's for a reason. <laughs> um, and what's interesting is that before um, before the Maersk um, experience, these sorts of things used to happen on a fairly infrequent basis. Um, so it'd be once every couple of years, it'd be like another big name, like a Yahoo or a Sony or something. But now it's 
every other day. Um, so it's 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 something that I would now be looking at, you know, instantly. If I was going to go to another operational role, it'd be right. Okay, j day number one, what's the status of this stuff, right? So this stuff would be, um, do we have an understanding of what our critical systems are? You know, if this business got wiped out tomorrow from a you know digital perspective, what are the applications that we have to have in order in order to operate? You know, I don't care about you know weird little macros or applications that are important to this one person over there but as a business what are the things that we really care about so we talk a lot about the tiered access tiered access models so these would typically be tier one systems but um, to me there's almost like a cream on the cream on the top so like tier one plus or something you know that's the stuff that we really want to know about and that's not good enough for you know that just to come from one part of the business or another it depends on how complex your, your organization is but um, you, that needs to be something that's consistent across business IT security everywhere everyone needs to have that level set understanding of this is the stuff that's really important um, and it doesn't really uh, you could cut that a hundred different ways like you could mark these things in your IT you know service management system or somebody could just you know just keep an Excel sheet somewhere like literally whatever it is have that understanding have that agreed across everyone because um, what that then allows you to do is to then say, right, in terms of the controls that we apply to things, you know, uh, workstations are sort of typically, you know, have EDR, whatever they have, you know, tier one systems, servers, um, application infrastructure, and then obviously tier zero, you know, domain controllers and so forth. But for that, for, the, for that sort of cream on the top, that tier one plus, the controls that we apply um, can be increased, you know. So as we go up through that up, up that stack, you can, we can apply the apply the sort of the duty controls to that tier one plus stuff, and that could apply, you know, in a, in a conditional access scenario as well. So maybe to access these things, you know, we apply slightly more stringent rules on, you know, types types of devices or the locations or MFA or what have you, you know, as people come to access that stuff. Um, so there's the controls that we apply to assets. Um, there's also the vis visibility of assets. So do we know what we've got? You know, you can't manage what you don't know about. So is asset management strong? You know, is it baked into your delivery pipeline? You know, as you're, as you're, as you're delivering applications, do we know that every time infrastructure for those apps gets onboarded into our asset management system? Or is it a case of, you know, six months, every six months it's like an audit process or something where, you know, all the stuff that was built over the past six months, you know, people have to go, you know, amnesty, you know, here's my thing. Um, so it's those sorts of things. Um, asset management, baseline controls, um, and identification of, of business critical services. Very good. Did Maersk have... I, I lit up at the conditional access thing you said, because as I think of, th that's an that's entry point for me with a lot of customers. Working for Microsoft, I often demonstrate conditional access, ask how customers are using it. And it's just one small piece of what you're talking about, Gavin, but to a level of maturity that I see broadly, it's not there. I encourage people all the time to say, look, with conditional access, this application is more sensitive. Say it's a human capital management system where we manage direct yeah. deposit information, salary information. I should have to go through more stringent controls to gain access to that than perhaps something that is less sensitive, like, um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, like maybe a time and absence management tool yeah. or whatever. Um, and so nobody's doing that today. You know, they're, they're applying like one broad set of rules for everything. Like this is our mm -hmm. rule. We do MFA here. We don't do MFA here. And I try to say, let's, let's start layering in more because the tool's capable of it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a mindset where you have to do that. And it, it goes all the way back to your broader point of, I think a lot of organizations don't have that maturity of having identified mm -hmm. tiering for different applications or different environments or whatever. And that's why it can't implement it. Like the guys I'm talking to oftentimes are, you know, identity and access management engineers, and they're just doing what they're told. And somebody else kind of has to work with them to identify like, Hey, what, how sensitive is this? How sensitive is this? What are different levels of controls we're going to require for them? And so that just really resonated with me as, as something I think our listeners can take away. Mm -hmm. And I am not targeting any one person. I'm just saying I get to see a lot of enterprise level 
behavior and I'm not seeing enough of that. And, and I know there's tools, Microsoft and otherwise that are capable of it. So I, I want to see more. So totally align with what yeah. you're talking about there from identification, tiered um, access management and, and all of that. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've got this sort of rule that it, you can never judge because everyone's got their own different backgrounds, everyone's got different motivations, different pressures, different you know, constraints, different restrictions and so on, individually sure. and as organizations. And you, know, you go in somewhere and you know, maybe it looks like a bit of a mess or maybe the priorities are wrong or whatever, but it's, it's like that for a reason. And you can't really, it's impossible to judge, but it's about helping people see what the options are. Um, right. And the way I, I can't remember who it was, there's a few different um, methodologies around managing conditional access. I really like, um, I think it was Alex Philippin who had the um, um, code, um, code based approach. So he had, he had like rings built in there. And one of the features was that I really hooked onto was it aligned to, is it in the States where it sort of goes from unrestricted through to restricted, secret, top secret, that kind of thing. So I really like that methodology of saying, right, let's, let's identify sort of three or four levels of sensitivity, you know, going from stuff we just don't care about, like maybe the office activation app in Azure AD through to, like you said, you know, human capital management. So up, up through there, you know, you'll have your, your different sort of levels of control and, and, and restriction. Um, but sensitivity is one aspect and then criticality is the other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those two things what we should be using to sort of play into, you know, what level of control do we apply to stuff? Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, then you've got sort of risk uh, versus, you know, impact. And, you know, there's all sorts there's, there's sort of matrices of things which go into what that can look like. But it's, you know, that's that's a, one of those journeys that we go on, isn't it? You know, you start from we even forced MFA <laughs> to, you know, something more like that. And even if you, don't, you know, you don't need to boil the ocean either. You, know, you can start off with you know, lightweight, fairly non-intrusive, you know, it's not like you have to sort of do everything in a day, but, um, you know, the important thing is we get people onto that, you know, onto that trajectory. You talked about that in your blog post a bit from kind of that, that trajectory model of where we don't have to do everything all at once. We could just do as devices roll off or as systems roll off as if we start doing it net new moving forward, that's really important. And I'd say, again, just drawing on my experience, that's another challenge I often run into where you have people whose brain immediately goes to, how can I solve all of the problem? Yeah. And I so often encourage them like, that's great. And, and I want you to think that because we do have to solve that eventually, but where can we start today and start yeah. doing something? And this applies to so many different things. And then one other point you just kind of almost threw away there, but I also think is really important because I even conflated the two when I started talking about it was you drew the distinction between sensitivity yeah. and the, the criticality of it. And that's another really good point of those are related, but they're not the same. Mm -hmm. And and I even kind of conflated them when I started talking about like HCM, which I would say is also critical um, operationally, but there's systems that might be sensitive, but aren't critical and vice versa. So um, yeah. that's a really good call out as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I take the example I saw recently, which is the one that convinced me that hybrid is always gonna be here um, around, I think it was a printing um, business and they needed their on-premises systems to be, you know, right next to their actual manufacturing, you know, the, the printing systems, because they needed so much data so quickly that there was just no chance they could have stuff in the cloud. Um, so for them as a business, you know, anything that's directly related to the, the activity of printing stuff and getting that out the door, you know, that's the, that's the critical stuff. Mm -hmm. Things that aren't directly related to that, you know, maybe it's important, maybe it's not business critical. You know, so there's a real, I mean, that depending on who you speak to across the business, there's going to be arguments as opposed to what's, you know, over that line and what isn't. But that's, that's part of the, that's part of the beauty of the work, right? <laughs> but yeah, they, they are, but they are separate things. I often say security is a journey and, you know, there's the metaphor of how do you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. And mm -hmm. when I'm doing my projects and trying to improve the security posture of the company, we'll often do something in a project called stop the bleeding, right? So we'll 
all new systems are going to be configured with this new configuration or this new app or the thing that yeah. we're trying to do versus what Adam, you know, customers may automatically go to is, oh my goodness, this is such a huge thing that we got to flip the switch on for all of our systems. Yeah. But you can just start with the new systems and, you, you know, yeah. as systems uh, go offline or get replaced, they, they have the new one. And that, that may take a while, but it's, it's not a reason to not do it, right? And there's, it's, there's things that might feed into that as well. So let's say you're in a cloud, you know, um, cloud adoption journey, you know, these, these journey words. Um, you know, you could say, right, we're going to set up what good looks like. We're going to build to that standard. The old stuff, maybe we do something to it. Maybe we don't, but maybe we'll just leave it where it is because we know that in two years' time, it's going to be, you know, retired anyway. Um, but one of the things that I think we get hung up on is perfection you know and and i'd, I'd like to stop you know stop the bleeding works but um when you look at the range of controls so let's think you know you could have things like you know um, intrusion detection um you know security baselines there's all kinds of stuff and what people tend to do is think i've got to build all that stuff ready to start building the new things into but this is so big in of itself is that actually you could spend a year or two trying to get to that point where you could start building into it just get moving you know we know we know there's going to be a range of controls we know that everything's not going to be perfect you know things never are but um what what concerns me more now um than even back in the day was these big events would be every few years but now we see them every it's almost every day <laughs> You know, it's like there just isn't the time. You know, the, the the likelihood of these things is only going up. You know, the commoditization the commoditization of all these tools that people are using to attack businesses and organizations, you know, it's terrifying. Um and even more so now because it's the the Mersk event was a it was a state sponsored attack against Ukraine, you know, and we just got caught in the crossfire, you know. Um and, and a bunch of organizations did. But what what's what's scary now is that it's it's sort of turned into big money. So, um, you know, we're going to come and encrypt all your data and, you know, not only that, we're also going to release the data, you know, the people's personal information, we're going to release all that unless you pay up this ransom. So there's big money in it. Um, and that's just, man, if I was, if I was somewhere now where, you know, I didn't have a good handle on my, you know, the assets and privileged access, I'd be more worried now than I was, you know, four years ago. That's for sure. Did you guys see a tweet by Chris Krebs the other day, maybe it was yesterday, and I don't know if he said it or one of his, the replies said it, but there was speculation around should there be um, regulation or law that prohibits the pain of ransoms? What are your thoughts on that? Prohibits the pain of ransoms. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I think I saw earlier in the year, earlier in the year, it's January. <laughs> <laughs> it's been the longest January ever, so that's okay. Um, well, it was either early in the January or late last year, but there's there's been a few things that have come up recently about either legislation or um, regulation, standardization, and even like a doctorate of IT security. There's have been sort of things like that floating around. Um, it does feel like we're in the middle of something, some kind of change. And I think it'd be really difficult to legislate. Um, let's say, for example, you know, you will do principle of least privilege because it's just such a huge thing. But in terms of, you know, you've been attacked um, and we all say, you know, don't pay the ransom because, you know, bad guys, we don't want to sort of give, give baddies some more funding, etc. But, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, you're the, if, you're the, if you're the people running an organization and you've been taken out, you know, to have the option, um, insurance for companies making big money of this, it, something needs to happen, something needs to change. I don't, but I'm not, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's such a massive, complicated issue. I don't know how mm -hmm. they do it. I don't know how I think it'd be... I can't, it's, it's like, if you think about the age of the IT industry as a, as the human, as a human race goes, IT is such a new thing. You know, we mm -hmm. all think we know everything and we're so, you know, modern and mature. We've got these advanced cloud controls. It's all new stuff to us. So we're still grappling with it. Um, and the, you know, the, so the pace of change doesn't help. Um, but how we tackle this thing 
it's it's probably going to be something that's going to be going on for years and years and years because it'll be somebody will introduce something it won't work they'll change it you know it'll go back and forth and then you've got at an international level you know to about the US but you know Europe or you know UK now is <laughs> out of Europe so we'll have our own separate set of stuff um, it's it's a minefield I mean if you look at GDPR mm -hmm. and how kind of complicated that's been because that all that's really saying is you should be aware of what information you hold on people, what you do with it, how you share it, you know, and if people want to get a copy of that and or, or, or delete it, you know, that should be doable. In a nutshell, that's basically GDPR. But you look at the amount of money and complexity and solutions and, mm -hmm. you know, just that on its own has been a huge thing. And that's been going on how many years now, you know? So, um, yeah, it's not a simple... It's not a simple question, is it? No, it's no. not at all. I, I think it'd be difficult to dictate to companies to not pay unless you are going to also provide some sort of mitigation for them, right? If you're going to legislate, hey, you can't pay the ransom, but we're going to help you protect your company, um, and these are all the things we're going to do. You know, it's like... Um, that guy who comes to a meeting and says, no, we can't do this, we can't do this, but then they don't provide a solution, right? Yeah. Um, exactly. You don't like that guy. You, you want to actually, why can't we do this, and then here's the alternative. Uh, so, you know, if the government were to legislate to and say companies can't pay ransoms, well, they better have a, an option um, that is better than what we have today. I, I kind of like this doctorate idea because... I number one, I hate this term thought leadership. <laughs> it's just, it just makes my skin crawl. It's cringy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, um, but I that's what I've been called a couple of times. It's like I uh, I talk a lot. I'm not sure my thought leader. <laughs> no. um, but it, it the idea of there is a prescribed. So an awful lot of what we do, you know, in our different sort of capacities, is we say, here's some things you should do. Yeah, this is good somebody i know doesn't like the word term best practice so i'm trying not to use the term best practice but um, <laughs> here's here's some stuff that works and it's been proven to work you know so maybe don't try and make things too comp too complicated for yourselves just do these simple things and you'll be in a better place and i think in the in the blog post i sort of termed it as um was it not leaving the door open you know um maybe you don't have to do everything but you know just do enough for who you are and what you do and your scale that you are you know just do these things um and i feel like that's that's kind of missing and then maybe maybe it's something like uh you know people don't really do ad training anymore or you know the pace of change the, the way that people consume information now um i think i was talking to andy um a couple of weeks ago and we were saying you know we've both got twitter bookmarks that sort of you know go back into the distance but you know the search feature there is rubbish so everyone's got all this information hived away but no way to get at it you know Mm -hmm. maybe maybe the the solution isn't to say you know have legislation f following the fact but get everybody to a better place you know to start with and reduce the reduce the likelihood i mean i think they're two it's an interest that's another interesting avenue you've got these sort of two um avenues of thought you know we need to have our contingency plans and focus on that and how do we recover and that's the only thing we should be you know placing any value in and the other one, and this is sort of my background, is just do the protect thing really well. And, you know, you, you should have a contingency plan, that, that stuff matters, but you should absolutely be protecting yourself. Um, and then that leads you back to sort of the NIST, you know, the five the five principles of NIST, you know, the identify, protect, etc. I think I, that's something I've been sort of going to for the past, well, since the Maersk events, you know, that's, that's NIST was what, you know, I was talking a lot about back there. Going from... Um, a place where you know like any other organization there's sort of gaps here and gaps there you know let's let's focus on those five principles and then any any control that we're talking about you know I, I like to say the no control exists in isolation so if we're going to do uh, I don't know let's say let's say pick MFA as, as you know the obvious one so that's that's going to be your protect but okay so how what's the identify component of that you know we need to identify people who aren't using MFA or are somehow bypassing MFA you know, we need to be able to respond to those incidents, you know, detect them as well, etc. Et so it's it's never on its own. 
And that's something that I think the sort of the doctorate idea would go quite well with because you sort of bring in people who are and I guess the, the the current equivalent of that is your certifications so whether that's like some sort of Cisco cert or Microsoft cert or what have you um, but they change so frequently and they're very technology focused um, but at the same time I don't think what's the other one the, the sort of CCSPs and, and you know the, the IC what was it IC squared I can't remember the, the name but um, ICS2 squared <laughs> ICS2 squared, that's the one. Um, you know, that's then very obfuscated from the actual controls. I think there's sort of somewhere in between there that would be really useful because that's only because that's kind of where I've ended up. <laughs> yeah. You know, so be, I think that's I think that's where you know you, you go into these organisations and they're talking about um, you know the, the security team will be living in the IC squared space and they're in run, one room. And then you'll have the infrastructure people in another room talking about, you know, the Microsofts and the Linuxes and, and the networks and those sorts of things. And it's really hard to sort of get them all into a room, talking the same language, understanding each other, collaborating effectively. Oftentimes they're almost like competing or at loggerheads. Um, so it's almost like you need that, that something in the middle there. Um, I'm it's like the, the, here, but <laughs> the, you know, the network team is focused on availability and NetFlow and all of that. And infrastructure is focused on making sure that the infrastructure stays up and people have access to the applications. And, you know, the service desk is worried about, uh, you know, the number of tickets that are coming in. And yeah. then here is security coming in and trying to put blockers in place, right? And a lot of the times the teams don't understand why we're doing it. All they see is mm -hmm. that we're hindering their jobs. Right. I think you had a, another blog post that where you talked about how these teams all kind of need to get together and be collaborative about it so that we understand what yeah. the goals of each team is, you know, and we're not trying to work against each other. We're really trying to collaborate uh, and, and find a common ground so that we're not really trying to prevent the business from doing business. We're, we're here to enable the business to do business securely, right? Safely. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 that, that uh, yeah, I mean, safety is the word I I start to use a lot more. And I'm, I'm you know I'll never win this battle, but I wish we'd all talk about safety, not security, because you know depending on the industry that you're in, that can have a you know a greater or, or, you know, that could have a greater meaning. So there was a case, um, it was a hospital in Germany recently where they got attacked. Uh, there was some ransomware attack. You know, a person died as a result. You know. It's a direct line there. But even in, in, in the Maersk situation, you think about Maersk, what they do, you know, they're shipping all this stuff around the planet. What's to say there weren't sort of critical supplies in one of those containers that got held up at a port or something and that didn't reach mm -hmm. some destination. And, you know, it, th there could be all sorts of impacts. So there's the impacts to customers, and then there's the impacts to the people that have to deal, you know, deal with all the cleanup. Um, and, you know, within any organization, yeah, I guess the directory folks or the, the identity folks would be, you know, people who get leaned on a lot to get issues resolved. You know, it used to be, oh, AD's gone wrong, you know, oh, there's a problem with the domain controller. It, that would all be, always be the thing, you know, you, you trace it back to some misconfiguration somewhere. But um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a safety concern, um, I've lost the thread. Where, what was the original point you started on, Andy? Just that we need to collaborate together. Yes, yes. So, um, I mean, that, as a as a as a starting point, so that that conversation that happens is um, IT. We bought a thing, get it working. Okay, that's that's one place. Um, IT. This thing needs domain admins. Give me domain admins. That's another starting point. <laughs> IT we've got this problem we really want you to work with us on it you know that's that's another starting point and depending on what the entry what the what the start of that conversation is will color the color the response that people will frequently get um but it's about being aware of that and having the the nows to sort of say okay okay for a start not no <laughs> okay let's have a conversation about this how do we rework this to you know i'm going to get you to a place where whatever it is is working in a safe manner, you know, um, because what all of, and this happens for delivery teams as well, you know, even identity folks, 
we focus on getting a thing working. You know, application X needs to be implemented fine. I'll focus on application X and making it work. And where that leads to is, you know, you go and look at domains around the world and there's things like unconstrained delegation configured, you know, on service accounts because somebody didn't really understand SPNs at the time and just did the thing to get it working. You know, so mm -hmm. we've at that point, what we've done is we've focused on the application and we've opened up a risk to the whole enterprise. And that's what we're going to do. No, no application or no team or no, nothing is, is ever more important than the whole enterprise. So that's, that was always my um, way of approaching that. And, you know, you see, especially in the response to a cyber attack where, you know, you get um, all sorts of different security vendors coming in. They all want to do scanning and they all want to sort of have visibility. And they're all basically saying, give us all domain admin access. <laughs> so, yep. you know, you're going, a going from one point from where there's probably been X number of domain admins. And, you know, I've also seen the houses where, you know, domain admins was the delegation model. So, oh, we've got an admin, admin to domain admins, you know. <laughs> but, you know, that'll be what that is already, for better or worse. And then post-strike, post, post strike, there'll be like an increase because, you know, more stuff needs to access more things and have more visibility. And it's really about, okay, we understand we need visibility, but it's how do we get... What we've, what we've identified is that there's multiple parties that want this visibility. We're all trying to do the same thing. So rather than just increase the, the risk overall, let's go, okay, we'll have a way of getting this, but it'll be consistent and we're going to do it once, you know, rather than 10 times and just have a massive risk. So. I think you talk about that in your blog when you're, you were talking about implementing PAM at Maersk after the ransomware incident that was one of the tools that uh to try to get a handle on privileged access and uh you didn't go too much into detail and you don't have to do that now but i i think when you and i were talking about it the way that it was being implemented where they weren't reducing the amount of admins or privileged accounts that were going into a pam solution so it wasn't really actually reducing the risk overall right yeah yeah i think this um I think part of this was essentially half down to the common approach of what I've learned is generation one and two PAM products. So we're going to introduce some sort of vault. And what we're going to do is we're going to take away everyone's domain admin access as the obvious example. We're going to take away everyone's domain admin access and we'll have a bunch of vaulted accounts. But by the time you actually go through that process, you don't actually reduce the number of accounts that have domain admins. In fact, you probably increase it, you know, and although you're cycling those credentials, you still have a bunch of domain admin accounts there, which is kind of uncomfortable. So um, that's where that was one of the things that really made me think, yeah, I could I could do something at StealthBits because they're, you know, the approach they've got is where they don't have standing um, standing access. It's all basically just in time accounts. So rather than just in time access, it's we're going to see where you're trying to sign on to. We're going to see what domain controller or whatever that's talking to for its authentication. And we're going to go to that and create the account there, you know, so we're not going to sort of bother about replication or the rest of it. We're going to create the account where you need it. And then as soon as you're done, deleted, you know, um, and you get to a point where there's virtually zero standing access, which is, you know, from my perspective, a whole lot more comfortable, but you know, there's, there's a, there's a bunch of things wrapped up in there. Um, so, you know, the approach to how you get control over your accounts and your privileges, um, I, I think it starts with visibility, you know. Um, I remember I had a big sort of tiered access box drawn on my, uh, um, on my sort of wall at work. We had these sort of massive like whiteboard things you could just write everywhere, it was great. And I had a big box right behind my desk. And I had on the right hand side was, you know, the the a nice shiny tiered access model and on the left was where I thought we were and like, how are we going to sort of get stuff across from here to here um, and a big piece of that's just visibility you know you need to know who's got access to what and I guess that goes back to you know if I was going to go into a new organization now you know what would be the first thing um, and it's, it's the principle of these privileges is important you need to understand you've got those controls there but you need to start from you know where are we um, because once you know that, you can identify, okay, there's a path to getting from, let's say, you know, bad to good, but also you can identify your hotspots. So maybe there's like some element of infrastructure where, 
you know, some service provider or team or what have you, you know, everyone's got full access to everything in that one area. So maybe that's the one you want to you want to like focus on. Or if you think that's going to be going the way of the dodo in a couple of years' time because we're going to be moving to the cloud or whatever, you know, it's it's just about understanding A to B rather than um, just trying to do everything at once or maybe focusing on the things that aren't going to actually reduce risk that much or, you know, it's better being a bit more um, intelligent with what you target first and in what order. The, the, my boss talks about making a bigger security improvement across the enterprise rather than these targeted little smaller improvements like what can make the biggest impact with the little less amount of work basically yeah, you know yeah. a configuration that we can change to try to really shore up stuff yeah yeah i mean that goes back to so when we we're talking about that sort of th that um the hierarchy of risk you know from workstations to domain controllers you know that stuff up there that tier zero stuff you know, every time, you know, get your enterprise admins, get your domain admins, et cetera, into some sort of um, um, uh, PAM solution. Um, but that takes a while as well, because you've got to look at, okay, what, how, what are our access paths to domain controllers? You know, what accounts have the access? How do we, how do we tie that up? So whilst you're looking at that, the data that you're also getting from somewhere else, that can be then what you use to start targeting other things within the in, other things within the environment. So whether that's going to be your migration path overall, or targeted things to, to particular hotspots, um, but you know, start with that top level stuff, work your way down, um, or maybe do bottom up. It depends on what your resources are. You know, if it's just like you know, one dude somewhere who's sort of struggling on his own, you know, it's probably going to be one thing at a time. But you know, depending on the amount of resource you've got, maybe we do more than one thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, when I looked at my company when I first got there. I, I targeted a couple of different things, you know, just to give our listeners kind of an idea. But if you're looking at your global admins for Azure AD and you have 20 global admins, right, and service yeah. accounts and global admin and MFA isn't enabled, that sort of stuff, right? So those are things that are massive that you should get a handle on. Um, if you have everyone in the domain admins group, you know, like you said, they need administrative access, we're just going to put them in the domain admin. So those are things that I, I looked at. And then also, yeah. you know, who has local admin on workstations, right? Oftentimes uh, you'll have uh, just either the administrator account is the same account across the board, like you're not using laps, or you yeah. have um, service desk folks who have a, a group that is added by group policy that is local admin, and then, you know, a project comes up and uh, some guy needs to deploy an application and it's short timeline so okay he needs local admin to install these apps so we're just going to add him to this group but yeah. that group is also have rdp access to the uh different sensitive servers and that group also has uh, ad permissions but all this guy needed was local admin so inadvertently because yeah. you're using the same security group and you haven't built purpose purpose built security groups when you add him to it all of a sudden he has all these shadow uh Elevated Shadow permissions, <laughs> right, all, all over the place. So, yeah. I mean, there's a few things there. I, I just made a note there because there's, there's something I did um, on the global admins um, angle. There's, there's, a, there's a resource, I can't remember where it is. It's on the Microsoft site somewhere, but it lists all the roles, the discrete permissions that those roles have. And the way I did it was I listed all, I had three columns. Um, the first was the roles. The second column was um, the permissions within those roles, and then column C onwards, I just had like the different teams that were in IT, and I hid column A, and I said, fill out all the things that you do, for each of the teams, and I guess there's auditing and ways you can do that, but the, the team's so small, they just I just gave it to them for them to fill in. And they went, yeah, I do that, I do that, I do that, I do that, and then by the end of that process, it was like, right, okay you guys need to be in you know user admins you guys need to be in device admins you guys need to be in this this group that that role um and there was like two people that needed global admins you know from a situation mm -hmm. of you know 30 gas or whatever you know um and that was a really nice way of approaching that you know that's something we're looking at, at, at sort of stealth bits to, to do a bit more on and, and a lapse angle i mean that's that's a typical one isn't it you know organizations that have got 
password set by group policy, you know, oh, that's the same code everywhere now. You know, laps is just such an easy win. Um, um, and that's something that, you know, SB, the, the Stealth Bits SB PAM thing also integrates with, because that was something I used, didn't really get along with, was how PAM products tend to sort of sit within their own, you know, we, we're not going to sort of play nicely with anything else. Um, and you've sort of got to go all out on this one PAM product. And that's generally, you know, does well in terms of the licensing for the vendor, but um, it makes things a bit more cumbersome for the, for the organization. But LAPS is such a good one for workstations, you know, it just works. Just yeah, do when that. I was doing <laughs> research for SB PAM, I found that uh, they do integrate with other third party vaults. So it's like a bring your own vault, you know, it can yeah. tag into. Uh, but it doesn't even need, necessarily even need one because maybe we don't, you know, depending on what you do with it, you oh, don't right. even necessarily yep. need, need a vault. Um, but the but it does, yeah, it does integrate with labs. I mean that just just from a, a risk perspective, you know, that you mentioned about giving people admin access. I mean, there's nothing like a good um, <laughs> nothing like a good piece of malware and, and ransomware to really get minds focused on. Do we need so much admin everywhere? You know. Um, and getting to a point where that's just a fat out, like no rule, you know, people don't have admin access. Um, yeah, that's and another thing. Uh, as I was looking across the board, that I want to tell our listeners about is Exchange Admin. Exchange Admin is probably you know the second most powerful role in a company when it comes to Azure AD or on-prem permissions. Yeah. And so. When I got to my company, we had a bunch of you know, exchange admins, almost as many as global admins, which was alarming to me. I remember mentioning it to Adam in our little thread, and I was like, we have like 15, 20 exchange admins. And they're like, yeah, that's that's bad because you not only have access to all the groups, but you can add mail flow rules. You can uh, filter different mailboxes. I mean, there's there's a lot of different things you can do with exchange admin and since all of our communication mm. is, is email nowadays, right? That's very concerning and so you know one of the things that you can do is which is you know I'll knock on Microsoft a little bit because it does get a little bit complicated the rules themselves and the role I'm sorry the roles themselves are not built into Azure they're actually built into exchange so yeah. you have to go into exchange to configure the different roles like recipient management or you can create a custom role with different permissions, which is what I did for the service desk. Um, some of that stuff flows over, right? Like if you're a help desk admin within Azure, that role kind of gets inherited into Exchange. But you can create a custom role and say, you know, I want them to be able to modify uh, mail-enabled security groups. Don't have mail-enabled security groups, by the way. <laughs> um, or other distribution groups and stuff like that, but not give them access to modify mail flow rules and, and stuff like that. So yeah. um, that's definitely something to take a look at for permissions wise as exchange admin permissions. Yeah, I mean, but even at least the role has got consistent names now, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the, um, I mean, the, the, the roles thing across O365 and, and Azure AD, um, it, it is it is difficult because you you start from a point where most organisations have come from some sort of on premises infrastructure moving up to the cloud you know maybe they've been doing that for years now or maybe they just started on, on that journey but you know you, you it starts off as something that doesn't have the governance in place and doesn't have you know the mature controls in place it starts off with oh well we've just opened up an account and. Oh, I've, yeah, you can have access to this. It's all new. It's not production yet. And, oh, yeah, you can come in and do your thing. And before you know it, access creepers just come in. And it's then really difficult to roll that back, you know, because people have got the access. They don't want to give it up and, and all the rest of it. So it, it can be really tough. You know, you can see how it, how it sort of spirals out of control, you know. Um, and I think that's just a natural part of that journey. You know, your organization is going to get to a point where everyone sort of says, yeah, this is this is a bit daft and... We need to be doing this better and, and all the rest of it. But the danger is there's gonna, there's a period there where, you know, you've got all this access, and the likelihood is because of that, um, because of the way it's because of that journey, the nature of it. You know, people have started off from a point where they don't have Azure managed workstations. You know, I am just administering Azure from my common workstation. 
and I'm browsing the internet and I'm opening emails and all the rest of it. And I've got my GA credentials right here. And, you know, so there's, there's a real danger point there, you know, as people are, are adopting these features, you know, and I don't, Adam, I've never really. Yeah. Adam and I, we mentioned that blog and maybe Adam, you can mention it again where Microsoft put out guidance on uh, even pr like a Azure privileged workstation, right? Like you mentioned, yeah. uh, Gavin, that, you're administering Azure from your regular workstation. I think the guidance in there says that you want to actually have like a paw for yeah. Azure administration, right? Yeah, it's a Alex Weiner blog post, and he's great um, in our identity team. And he's he's talking about several different things, kind of in the light of the Solorgate uh, compromise and and some guidance that that. I posted on LinkedIn several weeks ago and said something to the effect of this will raise eyebrows because there's stuff in there that uh, is kind of obvious now in hindsight. And there's stuff that mm -hmm. is kind of new or different guidance than had been provided before, where really the overall goal is to create more separation between your cloud resources and your on-premises resources so that the compromise of one does not automatically lead to the compromise of the other. Because what had been happening was on-premises environments were being compromised through Solorigate. They were obtaining the signing keys, the private keys for SAML implementations for federated identity providers. And then they could forge SAML tokens that said, I'm the global admin and it would show up and be presented and it matches the public key. So it's not even a compromise at that point. It's you signed it with the key. It's good. Mm. I'm going to let you in. And if we could at least create separation so that just because I can own that, I can't get there is helpful. And it kind of runs in the face of the traditional strategy has been this real hybrid identity model where we wanted everything to kind of be linked together and it's all one happy thing. And, and now it's kind of walking that back a little bit. So, you know, that's, that's modern security is learning and adjusting. So we can put the blog in the show notes, but I think the specific call out you had Andy was around having some sort of managed workstation specific for the administration there. And he walks you through it from the perspective of setting up conditional access controls to look for that kind of device to how you manage it cloud only with Microsoft Endpoint Manager, how it is cloud joined with Azure AD join. And, and it walks through stitching all those pieces together so that when you show up and you try to sign in with global admin creds, you're going to have to be coming from that trusted managed device and not just any old device. And mm. that's a really good practice. And you can still layer in things on top of it, like you must do MFA on top of coming from that trusted managed device. And now we've built so many layers of protection in that are going to be really, really helpful to prevent a potential attacker from being able to just show up and wreak havoc. I mean, you talked about how sensitive Exchange Online is. I mean, right there, you could you could ruin a whole business's operational capability if you don't have email. Take it from somebody who worked at a place that didn't have email for two days <laughs> and uh, you, you learn how critical it is real quick. That's, I mean, that, that point about the, the, the CA controls and, okay, we're going to allow these workstations that we trust to access or sign into you know, using, using GA. But, I mean, that, that's a similar sort of situation that we're talking about with the other sort of more sensitive stuff. You know, maybe for your HCM thing, you know, maybe we're going to say, you know, devices have to match a certain, you know, type or what have you, you know, to come to come and access, you know, this particular resource. We don't want people accessing this stuff from a mobile device. You know, there's all there's all kinds of things in there. So that's just part of that layering. But the the thing about I feel really vindicated with this guidance because I used to, I used to <laughs> use this term blast zones, right? So we talk about tiered tiered access model. I, I think of tiered access model as like the vertical. Um, um, uh, slicing of an, of an environment and then horizontally is really principle of least privilege um, so within an application we're going to sort of silo that horizontally you know across that tier but the, the thing about Azure AD is you know if you've compromised if, uh, compromise today typically still comes from on-premises so Solorigate was a bit of an odd one because you know the, the attack vector was the, the attack vector was the unique thing in this case. None of it was new, but the, the fact of coming in via, you know, uh, something that we knew that everybody, well, a lot of people were using and already had that domain admin access meant that we didn't really have to do a lot of, you know, traversal or escalation. It was like, boom, keys to the kingdom. Um, but given that it's often on-premises that gets owned first, we want to protect our cloud assets from that. You know, so I really like this, this, uh, this, this, 
guidance now that says, you know, um, the the two are separate, you know, and we're not gonna um, we're not gonna flow global admins up to Azure AD. You know, those are gonna be separate cloud accounts. Um, domain admin accounts don't get synchronized. You know, keep 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 the that sort of tier zero level of privilege isolated to to the directories. Um, I mean, that was, we, we were, um, I don't know, I'm being really careful not to go down avenues I can't really go down, but um, that makes complete sense. You know, I'll, I'll park it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that is a great point to stop our, our conversation. I think we had a great conversation around uh, privilege identity and, and all the things. And I appreciate you coming on, Gavin, and uh, spending time with us. Uh, it's afternoon over there in the UK. It's it's morning here for us. But uh, thank you very much. We'll uh, add your uh, information in the show notes so people can access it. But if you just want to let people know where they can find you, so if they have follow-up questions, uh, they can reach out to you directly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm all over Twitter and LinkedIn. So um, you know, search my name. Uh, there's a few of the Gavin Ashton usurpers out there who I've got to sort of get get hit at some point but uh, i think it's a guy who rides horses or something but uh yeah gavin ashton <laughs> without any of the, any of the vowels is my sort of my handle so gvn shtn everywhere um and then you know also stealth bits so yeah give me a shout there as well that's when you know you've made it when people are impersonating you on twitter <laughs> yes <laughs> well they, they should change their names it's just ridiculous isn't it i can never it's something i always look for and i went to a new organization if there's another gavin i've got to send him a message saying you know you know this isn't this isn't gonna happen this isn't gonna work <laughs> you know i got one of the very first um gmail accounts back when you still had to have an invite and and it's a kind of an ironic story because i traded and and you're not even going to remember this, but this is this is how long ago it was. I traded an invite to Orkut, O R K U T, for a Gmail invite, and I got on. And so I got Adam Brewer at gmail.com, which has been great. Except now all the other Adam Brewers of the world can't remember their Gmail accounts, and I get all their emails. So <laughs> sometimes there are downsides to being in early because I get every other Adam Brewer's email from across the planet, and it's really annoying. So. <laughs> You know, be careful what you wish for sometimes. <laughs> Identity issues, eh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, by All the right. way, I've got to mention, today is my first, this is my, this is my first COVID haircut. So you, you guys are getting a, you know, this is the sneak preview. This is the exclusive, you know, you've got the, the first, the first look. So <laughs> I hope it's not too terrifying. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, great. uh, I forgot that you had grown it out the last time we chatted. So yeah, it looks, <laughs> looks all fresh. Russian professional oh, or the and, show. And my, my six year old caught my nose last night. We were having a fight on the bed. And he, <laughs> I look like I'm sort of all mad maxed up. <laughs> I thought that was just a Love battle it. scar from, uh, exactly. <laughs> from your MMA days. <laughs> all right. So oh, thanks again, anyway. Gavin. Yeah. And thank you for having me. It's been really, it's been really great. I've been watching your, your show for a while and, or listening to your show for a while. So it's, it's the, the, the format really works and really enjoy it. So uh, thank you. For it. Thank you for having me on. We appreciate our it. Our pleasure. So our our information will be in the show notes. If you guys have any questions or follow up comments on the show, or if you have a security topic you guys want us to dive into, please reach out to us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.